when we are on stage and we're collaborating, every single moment we are improvising in timing, in blending our sound, in you know matching things or um, bringing out our line. We are improvising and reacting to what we are hearing and making something in the moment, even if it's written down. Hello fellow beings, welcome to Tapasya Loading, a safe space to attempt honest, raw and authentic conversation in homage to the ancient act of stoking a sacred fire. Sion, welcome. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on. I'm so glad we could make this happen. Thank you. I'm so glad too. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, we were just talking earlier on about uh, the differences in time zones. You are in Seattle. Yes. And it's eight in the morning. You made the effort to get up that early for this recording. <laughs> I'm so appreciative. Well, it's really fun. Yes, it's worth it. <laughs> I was also telling you about how I got away easy this time because it's only 8.30 in the evening here in my part of the world, which is currently India. So uh, thanks again. Welcome. And uh, I'm super stoked that you're on. Me too. Can't wait. I came across your work during an interview one of my business mentors did for uh, her academy. Um, Sonia Ramsey is the lady I'm speaking about. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very, very deeply, uh, well, honestly touched by the manner in which you addressed a topic a lot of us musicians seem to have a somewhat limited perspective on, uh, namely entrepreneurship as an artist. Mm. But that was one of the, it was very... Um, reassuring for me to see that there are other lenses uh, from which to view that specific aspect in an independent artist's life. Mm. And that's when I got in touch with you to see if I could convince you to come on and talk to me on this podcast. And turns out you are, well, the word that comes to my mind is super badass. <laughs> I mean, I'm skeptic about the whole name dropping thing, but when one, just to give my listeners an idea uh, of the caliber at which you work, uh, I mean, some of the people you've worked with are the Los Angeles uh, Philharmonic and the Air uh, El, El Philharmonic Orchestra, BBC Symphony Orchestra, Seattle Symphony, Toronto Symphony, Iceland Symphony. I mean, Jesus, this is creme de la creme. So I'm, I'm super impressed. I'm a little intimidated. And uh, no. <laughs> I, seriously, though, but it also kind of arrests my case and it just is all the more reassuring to see a musician of your caliber talk so vulnerably and openly in the manner you did on that interview I was referring to earlier on. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you, well, first of all, I, I love Sonia. I think she's, what she's doing is fantastic. And um, I'm so glad that that's our connection. Mm -hmm. And um, I... I do really believe in, in being open and honest and vulnerable about, yes, I've had some wonderful, wonderful experiences in music. And I've also had some really tough things happen and, you know, like figuring out how we um, can move in the world. I think, you know, we can all do it better together than we can do it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's it's one of my things that I I really love doing is is talking with people and trying to be open about my struggles and and hear about others so that we can we can help each other. So I'm so I'm so grateful that you're doing this podcast actually because I'm sure it's helping a lot of people, just like Sonia's um, interview helped you. So <laughs> I sincerely appreciate that uh, sentiment. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think one of the most refreshing changes in the overall sidegeist of its artists in the recent past, I think, is the manner in which approaches have gone from competitive to collaborative. I, you know, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but I yes. think that, that is a major shift. I mean, even 10 years back, it was not cool to be collaborative. It was not cool to mm -hmm. be cooperative. Mm -hmm. Is that an experience you've made uh, as well? Have you seen is that a change you feel happening? You know, it's funny because I think... Um, it's, it's sort of a slow progression, right? People, I don't know if you, if you know this, um, saying, and I'm trying to remember where it comes from, but it's like, um, something like, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but it's, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm. Um, and I think maybe 
there's a there's a sentiment of like you know um, sort of this rugged individualism, right? Like I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna you know take over the world. I'm gonna be this superstar touring the world or something. And then you realize that actually <laughs> that um, even if you get there, that's a that's a quick burn. That's mm-hmm. a that's a flash in the pan. But if you really build um, like you said, collaborations, if you build community around like-minded artists and really find people that can complement you and not, not, you know, I'm not saying that uh, compliment as in like um, bolster you or sort of <laughs> say nice things to you, but have maybe a different skill set or can, you know, you work really well together. There's synergy there or something mm. that's so much bigger than anything each of us individually could ever come up with. So um, I love collaborating and, and all of, I must say all of those, you listed off a bunch of um, wonderful orchestras, but all of those came about because of collaborations with composers. Wow. So even though I claim them on my, you know, CV, <laughs> mm-hmm. they're actually because of um, works that I collaborated collaborated on um, premiering with a composer that then people got interested in and, and wanted to share with their community. Beautiful. So, you know, it's, it's all about collaboration for me. And um, it's really... I love that you pick up on that because I I do think that that's at the crux of how we're going to get not only, you know, through the past couple of years, but um, how we're going to go forward. I really believe that. I so agree with you. Um, That being said, would you be all right if I rewind a little? I'd be super interested in where your musical journey started. That's a bit of a cheesy journalistic kind of question. Yeah. Excuse me. But, uh, but uh, I ask specifically because you also, um, and if this is okay to talk about, you come with a very unique cultural persona, which for me is personally, yeah. being of a hybrid background myself, is, is very, yeah. very interesting. Um, is it all right for us to go there? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I... So I was born in Iceland Mm -hmm. and um, my parents had me pretty young and my mother was um, in school. She's a violinist and she was teaching. And so, I mean, in my early years, I would just go with her everywhere. (laughs) She would just take me and sit me in the corner while she was teaching or while she was rehearsing or, um, and take me to concerts and just take me everywhere. And, and, after a while, you know, I started begging to be a part of it. You know, I didn't want to be separate. I wanted to be doing what everybody else was doing. Mm. Um, and I thank her for the foresight to not um, encourage me to do the same thing that she was doing. So she didn't want me to play violin, mm. um, even though that maybe would have been easier, you know, to, to just teach me what she knew. Right. I think she realized that she wanted to be my mom and not my mom and teacher, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. That's very enlightening actually. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, but so instead she found a, her friend <laughs> who happened to be the cello teacher and sort of, um, convinced him to, to teach me how to sit still and <laughs> the sort of, basis of <laughs> very, playing cello. Very important point you touched upon there, sitting still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was five when, when I started and, um, and then at seven, we came to the U S um, where I live now, but I, that's, that was sort of the first time we came, um, while my dad was doing some of his schooling, um, whether it was luck or whether my parents knew, or I, I'm not sure, but there was this wonderful, wonderful, um, music school in the middle of, um, Iowa Mm -hmm. in the U S which is sort of not maybe the first thing you think of when you think of musical excellence in the, in the U S but um, there is a wonderful, wonderful uh, school there for string players. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was surrounded by other kids, even though I didn't speak English, I was surrounded by other kids that played music. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, we would have group class, I would play an orchestra. We would have, you know, I would have my lessons where my teacher would basically um you know, we would sort of speak to each other through our cellos, you know, like I would, she would 
she would um, play something and I'd play it back to her. And, and sometimes she would sort of mimic the voice with her cello sort of, you know, burr, 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 and then I would, you know, sort of, and, and, you know, those kind of interactions, I think even solidified more how much music can connect people and communicate mm-hmm. um, when words kind of don't, don't do it justice. I can relate. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Uh, my, I grew up um, uh, a son to two traveling doctors uh, amidst four countries uh, until I was nine years old. Mm. We were constantly traveling, wow. grew up uh, speaking a mix of five languages as a toddler, not even realizing there were separate languages. Wow. And uh, music was the only constant in my life. It was the only thing that seemed to you know, function no matter where I was. So I can intimately relate, but don't let me hijack the conversation though. Please keep going. No, that's, that's, that's really fantastic. I love that. I love hearing about that. That's, that's, it's similar. It's the similar thing, right? That the music sort of connects us all. Yeah. It's that communication beyond words in a way. Yeah. So yeah. It's almost like you start off on a, on a, um, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, authentic, uh, method of communication in a way yeah yeah um, you know minus the um, cultural idiosyncrasies and niceties which you know oftentimes can be counterproductive to uh, genuine communication sorry please keep going i'm, I'm rambling here yeah <laughs> no i mean i i think um we went back to iceland and again the cello was so, sort of something that um was a a, a continuation you know it was something that sort of kept me grounded and um and I just at that by that point I just couldn't imagine doing anything else it was so part of you know what I loved it was it was such a big part of every day for me Mm. um that I just you know I remember my mom asking is there anything else you can do (laughs) (laughs) knowing knowing how hard it is you know knowing how it's how hard it is to have a, your pr- passion as your profession, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think not wanting me to lose that passion, even you know, even though things are tough. And and so anyway, so that's when I came back to the states, and um, and then I went to Cleveland Institute and Juilliard School. Stayed in New York for a two year fellowship. Um, wow. At uh, Carnegie Hall and Juilliard, which <clears throat> is now called Ensemble Connect, wow. which is a wonderful program. Yeah, it's a wonderful program that connects um, uh, sort of young professional or just graduated um, music and musicians with the public schools in New York City. Mm-hmm. And so once a week, I went to a public school in Brooklyn, uh, an elementary school, and just sort of did some creative musical things with them. And that was probably the most eye-opening experience I have ever had. Um, Just, you know, an example, when I first came and played for them, you know, a little kid raised his his hand, probably, you know, eight years old and asked, what subway stop do you play at? Because that's the only musician that he'd ever seen and that's his only worldview of of what a musician a professional musician does wow. yeah and so you know I, for me sort of coming from Juilliard and you know playing it in fancy halls you know that sort of brought me right back down to earth and just gave me a lot of perspective it, it's fascinating how that memory seems to have etched itself into your mind mm-hmm. well yeah because to me, especially being in school, you know, you're so sheltered from, you know, cons- I don't know, there's something about conservatory, especially in sort of very classical music, where they're really, the the, the hope is that you're going to be playing in a fancy orchestra, in a fancy hall, and, you know, <clears throat> I, I played at Carnegie Hall, at, you know, the night before, and, you know, mm-hmm. the, and then to realize that, yeah, this is just such a different perspective on what music is and what um yeah what a, what a life in music means so may i ask if yeah. that was the first time you remember being confronted with the, the somewhat disparate equations of these two musical worlds no probably not i mean i think i i realized well especially um all throughout school i would you know play in 
community settings. And um, especially there was a woman's shelter in Cleveland that I uh, frequently uh, played some music um, for them. And, you know, there, there's, there's sort of, um, I think definitely times where I realized, you know, they're different, but I don't know, there's something about that, that um, it, I think it was just the, the, the child's view, you know, the child's eyes, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. he knew nothing about me, but he just wanted to know me, you yeah. know, he wanted to, he wanted to know, you know, where, yeah. what, where do I play? What, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the unfiltered nature of these inquiries from children. Yeah. I say that from experience because I worked with a lot of children as well uh, in the arts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they can be so epiphanic. I don't know if that's a word, but I just made it up. Um, yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, with your permission, though, there there is a part I would want to rewind to again. Namely, yeah. uh, you talk about, um, you know, the part about how you were pretty sure about music is what you want to do with your life, like yeah. um, center it around it and your mother's mm-hmm. skepticism and uh, fears on, you know, mm-hmm. um, from coming from her own experience all from a good space. But I'm, I'm curious as to um, exactly, and I'm sorry if this sounds ages, but um, I'm just super curious. <laughs> how old were you when you knew like really knew, okay, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. I think I was, um, I think I was about 11 or 12. Wow. Yeah. That is pretty lit. Wow. <laughs> that is, that, that's one of the youngest I've heard. I've, I've asked this question to a number of guests and uh, I, I, I've, I tend to strut to my number around. I was 14 when I realized this is what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But 11, wow, mad respect. <laughs> well, you know what it was? There was a um uh take your daughter to work day huh. or something like this where my my dad's a doctor also. Oh. And uh, and I really wanted at, for some reason for like a month, I think I was 10. Mm-hmm. I got really excited about being an eye doctor. Hmm. Um and I I remember this so well because he, it was like, take your daughter to work day. And of course he has no time to, um, you know, be with me. So he finds his, uh, a colleague in the ophthalmology department or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and says, Hey, can you, can you take her for, uh, you know, let her just sit in the, in the corner for a couple of patients. And he said, sure, sure. And the first patient, he was um, draining a cyst in someone's eye. Oh my God. And I just couldn't take it. Wow. <laughs> I, is, just got, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just got so puzzled. Oh, hard relate. Got, hard relate. Yeah. I mean, as you can imagine, I grew up in hospitals too. So, you know, some of the, yeah. some of the scenery I grew up around. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, hard yeah. relate. So I guess yeah. uh, playing cello instead seemed like a way more... Attractive yes. incentive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, uh, I'm still curious though, between that point when you're, and uh, I'm guessing you were still in Iceland then and when you were living? No, sorry, you were uh, old in the US. Yeah, I was, I was in the US and I, I guess I was just, we went back to the US when I was 13. Yeah. Okay. 12, yeah. So from that, this, that realization that you want to become a musician, um, and mm-hmm. that's what I want to do for a living to the point mm-hmm. where you find yourself at Juilliard. I mean, it, that kind of been just like a seamless transition. What happened in between? <laughs> well, a lot of practicing happened in between. Exactly. <laughs> so that's you. where I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Tell us more. I mean, I, I, um, was very lucky. I had some great teachers, mm-hmm. um, who, who never, I mean, of course there were times when, when they, I guess I was, I was aware of the time that it needed to take, you know, that the time I needed to put into the cello, but I guess I always just had so many things to do. Like I was always preparing either for a concert or for a, an event or, a, you know, something competition or, or audition or something. And so three or four hours of practice every day, you know, from the time I was, I don't know, 15, didn't seem crazy because I just, I had, 
I had things I wanted to do. You know, I had I had, I had music I wanted to learn. I had things that that were exciting to me. And I think one of the greatest things that um, sort of the learning experience for me was when I was 18, you know, college starts in the U.S. at 18. And, and mm-hmm. in order to audition for different colleges, my um, mom actually took me around to, came with me to around eight different schools. And we really, you know, I played for the professors, but I also uh, listened in on a few um, performance classes and studio classes and met with the other cellists. And I I learned so much about different styles of teaching Mm -hmm. and different value systems and got a different feeling for each school. And I just thought, oh, it's not, it's not the same at all, actually. Right. You can come at things from such different angles. And, you know, my mother being a teacher and being very, I, I think, acutely attuned to different pedagogical sort of systems. Mm-hmm. You know, she was she was very um, proactive and sort of pointing out to me, like, do you see how he's teaching that person? And do you see how this is happening? And I, I think that was such a great lesson for me. And I was lucky that I got to choose to go somewhere that I really felt was the right place for me. Mm. Um, I think think maybe that was a pivotal moment of, of realizing and having agency of choosing, not just to go somewhere where I heard that this was the best teacher. And so then that's where you go, you know, Um, but to really find somebody that I thought would help me become the best musician I could be, not just yeah, be sort of part of the a cog in the wheel of this sort of system that they're teaching. Mm, that's amazing. Um, if you could, and I don't know if this is an unfair question, but if you could pinpoint one aspect or any aspect to your role in creating that situation, if that makes any sense, where you have mm. that agency, what would it be? I ask because I, 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 think, I can think of so many younger musicians in th- at that phase of their life who tend mm. to get a little lost amidst the noise and really struggle to find direction and um, struggle to find the right mentors and teachers. So do you remember what your compass was? I, I guess because I've always had sort of this idea that music is communication. Beautiful. I, again, sort of going back to what we were talking about from my early life. Mm-hmm. But I didn't see it as training myself to be something that other people wanted me to be. Wow, oh, that's very powerful. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's the kind of conclusion most people come uh, at a very mature phase of their career or musical journey. I mean, I, I've had the ups and downs. It's not like I had... <laughs> I'm sure, I think I'm sure. Very, very, um, I look back now and I was like, I have no idea how I thought that at 18, but um, I'm coming back to it now. But I, I think, I think looking back, I think I realized, and I, and I, and I was so confident, you know, like I was also younger and I had a lot more, I don't know, courage to say to my teachers, you know, mm. what I thought. Um, how would they respond? <laughs> so, you know, this is one of the things that I think was really great about my teacher. I, I studied with Richard Aaron in Cleveland, who's mm-hmm. um, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. But he, I think to his credit, he really liked that I had personality and really liked mm-hmm. that I was, um, I sort of was, came with ideas and came with um, any sort of, I mean, I think that it was a, a sort of, he was trying to help navigate, you know, what, what I should do and where I should go and how I can nurture that. But I think, I think he liked it because it, it it challenged him a little bit. And so if I, if I may sort of (laughs) assume that, um, so those are the legit teachers. Those are the mentors. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, um, I really think that there's something about that that I've I've never found. In fact, there was a master class that I took where um, you sort of had to audition to get in. You played for the teacher, and then he chose people to play in the public master class. 
not mm-hmm. this is not with Richard Aaron. This is actually with someone very famous who teaches in um, Germany. But you know, he's very famous, very big teacher, and I really wanted to to play for him, mm-hmm. but I wasn't chosen. And there were a couple of us who, even though we weren't chosen, we stayed for the master classes because I wanted to learn. Mm. And at the end of these, I think it was a week of, of master classes. Um, he had one day where he said, okay, everybody that wasn't chosen and has stayed, you know, I really appreciate you staying. And it shows a lot of um, integrity that you, you know, have been sitting here and learning and not getting the chance to play. So I'd like to hear you play. And so, you know, we each got up and, and played a little bit for him and got some feedback. And and basically the, the lesson for me was, you know, I played this um, piece and he basically just played it back to me the way that I should play it. And I he just asked me to mimic him. And after mm-hmm. a couple of phrases of this, he said, you know, if you can play like me, why don't you just play like me? Wow. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, this is really not what music is to me. This is not my, that's not what I'm after. I'm not, I don't want to sound like, you know, no offense, but, you know. No, I, I totally get it. That that, that uh, sounds like an, I mean, that sounds like a very arrogant thing to say, a very wrong <laughs> and arrogant thing to say to me. I would be, I would be very jarred by something like that. I mean, it's hard to say, I, I, you know, sometimes, People use a specific set of words which don't necessarily get the vibration of the sentiment across. But when I just listen to that sentence, that is like one big red flag waving at me. Yeah. 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 And I think a lot of teachers, especially in sort of the classical music, you know, tradition that I come from, Mm -hmm. are stuck in sort of this... um, You know, in, in order to preserve the tradition you must just copy what came before you, you know, sort of traditionalist um, way. And, and I definitely respect, you know, so many of the great players of the past. And I, but again, I just don't, my, my aim has never been to sound like them. It has been to be the best version of me. Yeah, totally hear you. uh, Unfortunately, um, uh, I wish I could not refute you on the spilling over, I mean, the genre per se. I mean, (laughs) I I remember growing up around these rumors about classical musicians being inherently conservative, but my own experiences have proved that theory completely wrong. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've had the exact identical experience. Uh, My background lies in jazz Mm. and... um, yeah. Um, popular music for lack of a better term I mean that's yeah. what you used to call it back in the day when you went to school <laughs> anyways uh, and I, I mean uh, my first piano professor for lack of a term at conservatory was also an extremely uh, conservative uh, pedagogue in the manner in which uh, you know, he insisted I learn improvisation he, he just gave me like one fat book of licks to learn wow uh, yeah, and th- that was literally like the fundament of his approach to improvisation, and, uh, wow. and he did not take it well when I tried it. You know, tried my own stuff. Mm. Uh, wow. I'm trying not to be too unfair. So, I mean, the point I'm trying to drive in is, uh, if it's any consolation, I think these mindsets are. You know, I don't think genres are yeah. as interlinked as one sure. tends to think they are. Not anymore, anymore. Uh, anyways, and. Um, some of the most progressive musicians I've worked with, uh, my current mentor and professor, um, has a background in classical music. He's a violinist. Wow, well, fantastic. Uh, yeah, right. And, uh, you know, he is, well, you know, me, me, dude's a game changer, really. So, fantastic. point being, yeah, genres are not an excuse anymore. They really aren't. <laughs> yeah. Glad to hear it. People tend to use uh, their uh, labels as an excuse to kind of compensate for uh, insecurities. I'm, I'm being very, very explicit here. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> but uh, there, I hijacked the conversation again. I'm so sorry. No, that's great. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's rare for me to find so many points that resonate with me immediately, the, the, the stories you're telling mm-hmm. me. It's just, uh, I can relate to them very, very instantly. So, uh, yeah, this is me blurbing out in the middle. My apologies. Where were we? <laughs> um, so, um, w- what happens then? I mean, uh, you refer to this masterclass with this very prominent 
uh, teacher mm-hmm. who makes you realize mm-hmm. that you know prominent is not necessarily synonymous with uh, aligned yeah how did he use that uh, realization to your advantage i guess after school and after this um you know we were sort of this group cohort that did this two year fellowship and i think finding other people that felt the same way that i did you know again mm-hmm. we were sort of at the very beginning yeah. speaking about how it's collaboration and um I think that's where I I found my strength actually. I found strength Beautiful. in that. You want to tell us more? You want to tell us give us a few pointers on how um your experience helped you learn how to find these like-minded people and build a community that gives you support. Yeah. I guess it's it's about trying a bunch of different things like, you know, going to Europe mm-hmm. to have these master classes and realize, "Oh, th- this this person is not for me." But then you know auditioning for this fellowship i had no idea if it was for me or not but then realizing in some some of the during the process that oh this is actually this might be something that i'm really and not that one little taste can actually tell you what the rest of the experience is going to be like but mm-hmm. i guess there might be like little hints along the way and and trusting you know when i feel something is off it's not because i'm not um good enough or i'm not um you know there's something wrong with me it's just mm. that that's not the fit for me and thank you so much for saying that yeah well i think a lot of us i don't know maybe it's maybe it's again um this is just my experience but i've seen many people take on a lot of shame if something doesn't work for them they think that you know oh that must mean that um there's something wrong with me but that that's not yeah. necessarily the case <laughs> Yeah, in most <laughs> yeah that's a big one it's also very easy to fall prey to a specific kind of predator who are looking for exactly students like those to mentor the ones yes shame to cash in on i'm getting dark here but it's so yes. a very harsh truth it's it's really true and you know i'm so glad that you said that and and are explicit about that because i think that goes unsaid and shame thrives in um sort of not being uh, directly acknowledged. And yeah. so I, I thank you for for really hitting it on the head because there are teachers that do not have, that are very insecure themselves, right? Bingo. And then Bingo. perpetuate this this whole thing. So anyway, I'm I'm really against, and especially now that I'm teaching myself, I'm really against this sort of shame-based or fear-based kind of teaching where, you know, oh, you can't, you can't perform like that, or you can't do that, or, um, you know, it's not, it's not ready for the stage yet, or something like that. I, I think that's terrible. I, I really do. And I think music is, again, coming back, it's all coming back, it's communication, you know, and so yes. whatever you communicate, if it's your truth, then that should be celebrated. Yes, absolutely. Completely agree. Yeah. One of the things I really remember feeling good about is some of the words you used in that interview with Sonia and also uh, during the course of our brief correspondence via email when we were trying to find this uh, recording date. Mm-hmm. And I have a few bullet points <laughs> written in front of me, okay. that I am, cool. that I am, which is uh, <laughs> you said, you know, right now I'm int- very interested in one improvisation, creativity, expansive growth. That's the one I really want to pick on. A pick mm-hmm. a pick your brain and, and process these words. I mean, honestly, they could really be the words right out of my mouth. Maybe it's also the sidegeist. <laughs> I mean, after the whole COVID thing, musicians have been cooped yeah. up in their home. I think a lot of us have had a lot of unpacking to do. But um, improvisation has been something I've dealt with most of my life because since the, mm. the, the bulk of my craft is based on that. But when you mm-hmm. say creativity and expansive growth and process, wow. I mean, please... Mm-hmm elaborate more i mean these, i mean i can't even explain why i'm so excited about reading this word all i know is i just am so you know tell us more yeah well i i don't know if it's um yeah maybe it's covid or i think this was always sort of in me i'm i'm just an explorer and i and i this expansive growth i guess is what i've been feeling like it's not linear, is it? Like when you Bingo. really break through something, it really feels like, like the universe that we are just expanding. 
Bingo. And I love that feeling. I mean, it's the best feeling. And so that's why I say I'm interested in it because I see, I see it in me. I see it in my mm-hmm. friends. I see it in my students. I think there's such, um, there's such possibility. And I think that's mm-hmm. where the improvisation part also comes in is that I see there's so much possibility in improvisation mm-hmm. um, and this expansion of, yeah, what what music is, and a, you know, even um, going more into like more noise based or texture based um, improvisation. I'm I'm really interested in you know what the line is between noise and music. You know, beautiful. What, um, yeah, and so those, I think, expansion to me means on every level, right? Like not just our music, but just as a person, because our music reflects us as people. Mm -hmm. So I've actually invested a lot of time and energy in not just improving my, my, you know, technical abilities, my sound, my, you know, accuracy or, you know, those kinds of things, but um, in finding out why, why I'm limiting myself or why I'm, Um, you know, not expanding and trying to understand those kinds of, yeah, those kinds of inner things that then come out in the outer world. And so I'm, it, it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of time and it's pretty painful sometimes to really look at ourselves and admit to ourselves like, Mm. wow, I can't believe I'm still feeling this way. Oh yeah. I hear you for so many years to, I know that's very abstract, but to put sort of a, there's a very um, concrete example. Um, and, it's, and some of this is cultural too, but, you know, I grew up in Iceland and in, in, in a very mono society, right? Like mm. we're all very genetically <laughs> linked. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They'll look the same. <laughs> well, you know, every, everyone is, it's a very tight knit, small community. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, in order to feel a place of belonging, sometimes I have, well, some, somehow when I was younger, got the impression that I needed to um, make myself small in order to belong. Oh, right. damn. I hard relate again. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 In order to find sort of that community or, you know, that feeling of belonging, that somehow I needed to diminish, but it's actually the opposite. Indeed. And for me, emotionally, that was something that was like so ingrained in me. And I don't even know how. It's not like I can point to one specific time where yeah. something. Yeah, I was about to ask if, if you could trace the roots because I'd be super interested. Qu- a quick question. Um, I, how, how do you feel in monocultural environments? You know, it's interesting because on the one hand, it's very, like I said, it's very monocultural. On the other hand, it's so creative. There's mm. so many really interesting things happening. And the creative, the creativity is, I think, coming from the fact that Icelanders actually do go outside of Iceland for education, you know, and then yeah. come back. Yeah. And Iceland is, is a very, very special country. I mean, you know, yeah. hashtag Bjork. <laughs> exactly it says it all yeah. yeah so in in one way it's monocultural on the other hand it's very um outside the box and mm. very um creative so i don't want to paint it like you know um yeah i guess it's unfair of me to but there was something about my experience that has implanted this and maybe it was in the u.s i have uh, to be honest with you i have no idea but somehow i've inherited this feeling of Yeah, in order to fit in, I have to um, sort of let go of some parts of me that are too big or too much or too bright or too dark or you know whatever, um, mm. too loud. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Just just to clarify, for what it's worth, I didn't feel like you were being unfair to Iceland at all. I wasn't referring to, I mean, Iceland, like I said, is a very specific case, is a very special country. But I was referring yeah. to generally the, you know, mm. the the feeling of, um, I'm going to cautiously use the word suffocation in, mm. when, in monocultural environments, regardless of, you know, it doesn't, 
it doesn't demonize the particular environment or the culture in itself, but just some people, and I can't speak for you, I can only speak for myself, are just not built for monocultural environments. Yeah. I was yeah. Um, wondering where how, how you feel about that. I, I know for a fact that, you know, they have a term for people like me that we call third culture kids, people who spend their formative yeah. years. Um, are you familiar with the terminology? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. High Wonderful. five. Then. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, um, you know, I, I know that it's me feeling suffocated in monocultural environment has nothing to do with the quality of that environment. It's just me right. being only one part of me in that because, you know, I need the rest of the other environments yeah. that are part of me to feel whole. Yeah, I, I I definitely resonate with that. Yeah, maybe that's that's part of it for sure for me, too. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. On the other hand, I feel very, maybe because I live in the U.S., when I go back to Iceland, I feel like I'm home. Nice. Beautiful. And, and I, there's, a, there's a part of me that really feels comforted um, in that environment as well. But then, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, yeah. I mean it's, it's Iceland. It's gorgeous. <laughs> how, how can yeah. we not feel comforted in <laughs> It's just dropped it gorgeous. So, yeah, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, I seem to have digressed a little. I've lost my thread of thought, but we were talking about, oh, yeah, uh, improvisation and expansive growth. Um, I, I, I want, uh, I'm, I'm really going to dig into the expansion part of the growth you're referring to. But yeah. I have a bit of a nerdy question before that, because I think a lot of our listeners would be interested in this. Yeah. Please help us debunk the myth of classical musicians not being built to improvise. <laughs> yes. So this is something that I, I had a big block against. Mm. And, mm. and having sort of really pinpointed, you know, my, my hurdles, my own internal hurdles to get over that. Um, I really, I think... I've been improvising all my life. I believe you. And I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it. And um, I think as, I think the most direct parallel for classical musicians that believe they haven't been improvising is um, when we're on stage and we're collaborating, every single moment we are improvising in timing in blending our sound in you know, matching things or um, bringing out our line, we are improvising and reacting to what we are hearing and, and making something in the moment, even if it's written down, right? Like even if we're playing the notes that are written down, the way that we play them is inherently improvisatory because we're, we're, we have to react, right? We can't just play our line and then hope, you know, see you at the end, like match <laughs> that we match up by the time it's over. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. So I've been, I mean, that's, that's something that I feel like for classical musicians, I think you can straight draw a straight parallel and just say, take all of you already have all those skills. Now mm. just move them over to the pitches. Or move them over to, you know, take, take a melody, you know, take the pitches and improvise on the rhythm. Or, you know, like you, you already have all of the skills. It's just expanding them to other um, parts of the music that you're making. Mm. Wow. But in terms of really improvising, I, um, I think there was a moment when um, I really got the sort of bug and this was almost 20 years ago when I had a session in which um, there's a wonderful violinist Gilles Apap I don't know if you've heard of him but he is sort of he was a one of these young prodigies that then sort of went off and did his own thing and and he has I guess a little bit of background um, a Romani background and um, really went into gypsy fiddling traditions mm -hmm. and did a, and, and as well as um, Indian traditions, you know, played ragas and things like that. And I think, really, yeah. And, and that really expanded my, even though they were not in sort of the classical, again, genre, his session was all about listening 
about reacting, about how can I contribute to this sound and, you know, giving enough restraints where we didn't have to come up with everything. We just focused on one thing and, and how can you contribute? And, and that felt so freeing. And again, this expansion, it just felt like my idea of what I could do in music, how I could communicate, how I could contribute was just blown open. And I love that feeling. I, I, I guess you can say I'm hooked on I'm, I'm addicted to this feeling where things just open and you just feel like the possibilities are endless. It's the best addiction out there. Yeah. <laughs> the best and the most addictive in, uh, as well, I think. For, um, for younger classical musicians who feel that bug to mm -hmm. want to improvise but um, are grappling with some sense of skepticism or fear, what were your words of advice to be? To them, mm. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I think once we are in the fear mindset, it's very hard to get out of it. Mm. It's of course it's possible, but I think a, a little trick or a little you know something is probably not going to. I mean, it's maybe going to help in the moment, but I think really taking a step back mm. and looking at what what exactly. What are my fears? Taking a flashlight into the shadows, right? What mm -hmm. is really that I'm scared of? And that, that takes a lot of, again, vulnerability. It takes space. It takes time. Mm. But you can really unpack that and be honest with yourself. Sometimes our fears are so much bigger than what the actual, what it actually is. If we just mm -hmm. look at it, because we've been sort of pushing it away Right. And then it just grows and grows and grows. And then once we actually look at it like, oh, I'm actually, um, you know, terrified that someone in the audience is going to think I'm, I'm not good enough or something. Yeah. And yes. if you can look at that and think, well, who, who is that person? Is that person important to me? Does their, their, does their opinion reflect somehow on myself? How can I, how can I make a list of, values that are important to me so that another person's opinion is not as strong as my own opinion, right? Like how can I make myself strong and so other people are not as influential on how I feel about myself? Paying attention to the inner voice. Yes. Again, you're nailing it on the head. You're <laughs> yes. You're making it very easy. <laughs> It reminds me of a saying, and I got to come clean, it's not the first time I'm referring to that saying. Mm. You know, the manner in which you refer to how fears can feel so overwhelming. Yeah. One teaching I use every time I find myself in those situations is the saying that, you know, our demons are usually our angels screaming to be seen. Ah, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, just, I got chills. You said that, yes. I know, right? So we Definition. tend to demonize our fears without often realizing that, you know, they're just our unfulfilled desires that we've been neglecting for too long. Yes. Oh. Mm. Right? Yeah. I wish I could claim ownership of that saying. But it was, <laughs> I can't even trace it back to who exactly said it, but it, yeah. it, it keeps coming up. Yeah. Yes. We have so much to learn. Yeah, you can call them hurdles, you can call them demons, you can send blocks, you can, you know, whatever you want to call them. But absolutely, they're just screaming at us to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. It can be a risky space to ignore them. I believe it's never too late to make that first step towards alignment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, later isn't easier. Yeah. It's also not linear. Yeah. I relate very intimately to how you refer to the process of expansion not being linear mm -hmm. which is so difficult to remember especially with people bearing the baggage of a conservatory education oh. which is built upon this fundamental illusion of all of it being linear it's just you know you know here you go you go to conservatory for three years or five years and at the end of it yeah. you're a, you know you're labeled a professional musician because you just because you've ticked off uh, three years of boxes really <laughs> And, um, and and that has its place. It also, you know, really, uh, I'm very grateful to have had that uh, sure. opportunity yeah. as well. But yeah. to then balance it with a, a much bigger, as expansive reality. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is, uh, yeah, it feels like an eternal work in progress. So 
That seems like a good way to taper into uh, the next topic I want to pick your brain on, the expansive growth. Um, I'm especially curious because of the word expansive, because most people just go with growth. Mm. I, I, I had this, you know, I picked up on something on the way you use the word expansive in front, which I'm super curious about. What's happening there? Well, I think, um, and maybe this has to do with uh, the entrepreneurship part of it, that mm -hmm. that um, you mentioned earlier, but what I found is that there's something about once you find, especially with with music and with your you know the business side or anything, once you find something that really rings true, it's like and I use rings true because I think it's like resonating. Um, yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, like you you. It's it's incredible how you can try all these different things, right? And you think that you're plugging along and you, you see a little bit of growth and you, you're trying all these things. And then something happens where you hit a point and it resonates. And, and that's where that expansion happens. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that all the stuff before it wasn't important. It is. We can't just go mm -hmm. around, you know, expensive growth everywhere. I think we have to learn lessons and, you know, in order to get there. But mm -hmm. I think there's something about um hustle culture oh yeah that makes us think that our time and our energy has a specific monetary value or you know whatever mm. that but actually that's not true we can have so much impact with actually maybe not a lot of work or you know quote unquote work i mean of course <laughs> it's all work but it's 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 how you define it but There's a there's a moment when something triggers a resonating uh, vibration in those around us, or maybe not even around us, but somewhere on the other side of the world, you know, from Seattle to India. Absolutely. And now to all of your listeners, and now to, you know, who knows what that's going to trigger, right? And that's mm -hmm. the expansiveness that I think is sort of where we have to let go. You know, we mm -hmm. can't control it. I can't say that when I... Um, connected with Sonia that I thought, okay, now this is going to lead to the next podcast with, you know, like that. I could never have imagined that it would connect mm -hmm. me with you. What an incredible mm -hmm. thing. And now that's, I know, you know, right? especially after, after like weeks, almost months of trying to find yeah. a date to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think for me, the expansiveness is, is part of that. It's like learning to let go when something mm. resonates and not try to control it and to allow that to be what it is and expand in ways that you didn't maybe see and yeah. allowing it to happen. Completely resonates. It's, um, I mean, art generally, especially music, all the more so, you know, the sonic art, they, it does transcend time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, in, in my books, it's probably one of its highest purposes, just to remind us of our, I'm getting really woo woo here, but um, yeah. <laughs> about you know how time in itself is actually potentially not always a linear thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not I'm not qualified to expand on this, so I don't. I'm going to try not to make a fool of myself. Okay, here is a question. What I'm trying to get at, I'm, and I'm doing a crap job of uh, articulating here. Where does contraction fit in? Because I also have come to the conclusion, and again, personal opinion mm -hmm. that you know. The yin and the yang, the poles yeah. need to exist together. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, uh, it's so, uh, um, I love expansion, but mm -hmm. where does contraction fit in and how mm -hmm. do you know it's the right kind of contraction that is the proper counterbalance to the expansion we're looking for? How do you navigate mm -hmm. that? I mean, to be completely honest and, and candid, sometimes I don't know if it's the right kind of contraction or if it's the right... Well, and honestly, I'm not even sure there is a right or wrong, right? It's Oh, interesting. Yeah. We know, we learn from all of it, right? And mm -hmm. so everything can be valuable. It's just about whether, I totally agree with you. We need the yin and the yang, and there's no such thing as consistent growth. Mm -hmm. You can't consistently grow. 
that leads to burnout, that leads to collapse of the whole system. I think there has to be a regrouping, a, a, a reflecting. I think there has to be a, okay, how can we synthesize lessons learned and take it into the next expansion, you know? Beautiful. And, and in that time, we have to be, we have to be quiet. We have to be interior, right? It, it can't always just be this outside. Beautiful. Yeah. So I think yeah. whether it's right or not, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, do, I, don't, I don't know how to, I mean, part of it is, you know, a little bit of trusting again, the inner voice, trusting right. when my body says to rest, mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. you know, I've spent a lot of time pushing my body and um, to do things because I think I have to, mm-hmm. um, for my career or for my, you know, because I said I would, or because my friends expect me to, or my collaborators are waiting for this or, but actually that has led to me not, not showing up as my, in in ways that I know I could. Mm. Um, And maybe burning some bridges along the way because I, I wasn't able to be really open because I, I, I needed to, to rest. I needed to reflect. I needed to, learn before I did the next thing instead of just charging on, you know, sort of blindly. Hard relate. I mean, those could have been my words. Uh, and I'm not just saying that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a severe obesity survivor. So um, yeah, at my worst, I was, um, I was 110 yeah. kilos, could barely climb up the stairs, all in the name of wow. living, living the musician's lifestyle. And I went yeah. from there to 22 years later being a certified personal trainer. So I will be the first wow. to you know, um, talk about, uh, yeah, and uh, and I, I say it's not not as a trump card, but also sans meds, sans surgery, uh, yeah. and, and and the journey has been irrefutable um, testimony to exactly what you said, because mm. you know that's where it starts off. But you know, once we take the first step towards this mindset of it's okay to let my body or my well being pay the price for some projection of someone else's success at the end of the day right you know, that's like the first step yeah. towards uh you know towards well a, a painful painful end really uh, at some yeah. point so i'm um, to- totally with you there yeah and i think about um you know when you're on the airplane and they say put your oxygen mask on first oh, right. before putting oh. others <laughs> yeah. yeah i've actually used that analogy with a couple of kinds yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> nails it Maybe. It's so. It feels so counter to what we're taught, right? Like always, yeah. you know, help others and always be generous. And but yes. you have no help to others if you can't take care of yourself. Yes, I want to point to my. Uh, I mean, at my listeners, I want to point out at this point that you know, we live in an age where there's so many buzzwords and self help posts on Instagram. But you yeah. know, when when uh, someone yeah. is, uh, you know working at a high performance environment like you says this, I would really request my listeners to rewind and listen back to that from someone who works in a high performance environment like yours to come to these holistic conclusions it's it's just there's there's an additional depth and dimension to that and um, i really want to thank you for pointing that out well it's my pleasure i really i think there's nothing that could be better than really feeling good about what you're doing and who you are. And I, I truly believe that when, when you feel that in yourself, all you want to do is share it really. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm yeah. so, I feel so um, happy to be able to talk about this with you and, you know, knowing that it resonates with you is giving me, you know, it's, it's actually very selfish. <laughs> So you don't need to thank me. This is really, truly um, my pleasure. So Well, I'm being as selfish from <laughs> exactly the same uh, perspective. So, well, thank you anyway. We are coming towards the end of our, our conversation. I want to respect your time. I know you're an extremely busy person. I, I still can't get over the fact that it, you actually woke up at 8 a.m. in the morning to do this on the podcast. Thank you so much. But I wouldn't want to let you go without uh, picking your brain a little on your entrepreneurial endeavors mm-hmm. in the recent mm-hmm. past. Uh, again, for my listeners, uh, my business mentor, Sonia, runs an academy for uh, music instructors 
uh, looking to set up a sustainable business for marketing their knowledge and know-how, really. And you were one of the guests invited mm -hmm. uh, because during the pandemic, you launched your first course yes. and hit a 10K. Yeah. You made a profit of 10K on your course. The manner in which you described the process was very, very reassuring for me because in an age where, you know, at, at this point, every third ad on my Instagram feed is some course on learning another course. <laughs> But uh, I, I really love the early manner in which you went about it and stressed on the fact that Uh, even though you did put in the work to do some homework on uh, some of the business sides to it, you didn't deviate from a path you already were on. Instead, mm -hmm. figure out a way to integrate this new entrepreneurial endeavor into what you were already doing. Yeah. Mm, correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's exactly it. That's exactly, yeah. Right. So my first question is, number one, is launching an online course as a musician. It's like everyone's doing it these days. <laughs> so one, does does every musician have to do this? That's my first question. Uh, if yes or no, why? And secondly, what in your opinion is uh, success in launching a business like that? I don't know mm. why I ask these questions. I have no idea where they came from, but there you are. <laughs> I think I I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm just being super it. selfish now. I'm basically yeah. getting a free masterclass from you. No, it's fantastic. And I love talking about these and I'd love to hear your, hear your perspective on this as well. I, I don't think that every musician needs to do this. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. I think there are um, certainly ways to use the technology that we have, you know, available to us, mm -hmm. but You don't have to use every single one of them. You know, I, I really, you know, this is just one avenue that you can pursue. For me, it came from wanting to share. I, I was starting to see a pattern in my teaching that there are basic principles that I didn't need to. Well, I was saying again and again and again, right? Like mm -hmm. sort of broken record. And I realized, wow, these are really things that I believe in. And I believe that these are things that I actually don't need to be in the room with someone in order for them to learn them. And so then this technology enables me to not be in the room with someone. And right. that doesn't take away that there are other parts of my teaching that are more like coaching, right? There's yeah. more, yeah. there are other things that I don't want to use this technology for because it is kind of important that it is one-on-one -on -one and that I'm responding in real time to what's happening But we each, I, I, so if that isn't something that rings true with a musician, I don't think that the technology, like, you know, that it's just a tool. You don't mm -hmm. want to use, um, I don't know, like a hammer, you know, for, to, to uh, knit a sweater, right? So like use the tool <laughs> that yeah. fits for you, right? So that was a terrible example, but you know what I mean? Yeah, that, I hear you, I hear you. The second question was, what is success? And I mean, the reason that I, that I was on the podcast was because I hit um, um, a revenue of, of, of $10,000 you know, so, and, and I, in some ways that is successful. But in, in others, I think just the fact that I could reach people that I could never be able to reach one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. I think that is success to me. Mm. I mean, whether, whether a number, you know, a number of people, that doesn't really matter to me, but the, the possibility that somebody could find me and find my course and learn something where I couldn't have shared this information with them before. I mean, that's, mm. that's success. The more people, it's just, the better it's icing on the cake. It's, it's wonderful. You know, I, I celebrate that absolutely every single person, but I think the success is in just launching it and learning every day, how I can better reach people. Beautiful. You already answered questions. I was meaning to follow up with, which is one, how do you feel about online education? You answered that already. Mm. Um, all not music education, excuse me. And um, secondly, yeah, the definition of success. That being said, I'm pretty sure most musicians would be quite happy at making a revenue of $10,000 on the first course launch. Were you surprised? Were you expecting success to that degree? Um, 
I was surprised that, so again, it's like you never know what resonates, right? Mm. So I guess I was surprised by who it was resonating with. Tell us more. Yeah. So my thought was that this would reach sort of young musicians that maybe um, were not in urban areas that had music schools and were maybe learning to play the cello and maybe didn't have access to great teaching, right? And then this would be a way for them to learn from someone that they wouldn't be able to come to because, you know, they live far away or, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever the reasons. And it turns out that I think most of the people that were interested in this were actually older people played an instrument when they were younger and now want to, especially during the pandemic, wanted to pick that, you know, pick up the cello again and, you know, maybe didn't want to have lessons every week, but just wanted to have some of the basics again. Mm. And I just, I think how wonderful, like how incredible that there are people all over the world who want to go back to finding a creative outlet, you know, for, and something that they haven't done maybe sometimes in decades and come back to something and, and wanted to get better at, at something. I, I just think that's so powerful. And I just never thought that that would be an audience that I could, you know, impact. That's beautiful. Yeah, I yeah. intimately, I can very intimately relate. I mean, it reminds me of so, so many, some of my most favorite students and clients, actually, when you say that. Yeah. But did you have, did you, did, had you visualized a specific demographic as, um, um, as your audience for this specific course before you launched or did you just put it out there and well you know there was there was um you know I of course read some of the the like you on Instagram I'm getting you know thousands and thousands of ads for all of these (laughs) (laughs) online course creating you know gurus and everything and everybody has their free thing that they and one of the things is to find your ideal you know, customer avatar right, or whatever, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. And um, so I went through that exercise. And again, I think I was thinking, well, my ideal customer would be somebody that would actually come and study with me at the, I teach at the University of Washington. And so my ideal customer would be somebody that already, so was already thinking of going into music and was on their way. And maybe they would find this, learn this, and then would want to continue studying with me, mm. you know, so I, I thought this was going to sort of be a part of a recruiting tool and, but also help me to sort of foster and nurture, um, you know, an on-ramp for people to come and, you know, get more out of studying with me if we could sort of take care of that before they even come to, to the University of Washington. Wow, that was it's the, almost a, it's almost like a prep course. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I really, truly, you know, felt like there was a gap in the learning of some of the, the prospective students that I was meeting. And I just thought, okay, this is for them. This is, this is very specifically targeted to them. Um, and then, again, I was surprised that actually a lot, there are a lot of other people that um, wanted to learn and are just as eager for this information. And so I, I had to really, not that the, it wasn't a good exercise to think about, um, you know, who this ideal person would be, what kinds of things they were into, you know, all that, Mm -hmm. but it's more for me, it's more about the energy that this person has, that they're hungry to learn more online, that they're, they're open to, um, different, a different mode of learning that they are, um, yeah. So instead of talking about their gender or their age or their, you know, those kinds of things, I think, mm-hmm. especially in the era of diversity and equity and inclusion, I think it's important to market to an energy or market to interests or market to um, more more um, meaningful traits than so true. What we look like. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. A bit of an eye opener, really. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, you know, as as 
we've all learned we've got our blind spots, right? And me too. And and I think mm. the blind spot for me was if I don't limit myself, I could have an impact that I didn't even dream of. So um, it's not just for, you know, the world that I'm doing this. It's, it's again, it's a feedback loop. It's selfish and it helps. So it's, it's, it's a win-win. You keep saying selfish and I get it. I love the humor in it, <laughs> but you, you know, about me, it really isn't. I mean, it's just, it's just a realization of a certain sense of separation, not really existing in the manner we are programmed to think it does. Yes, that's it. Bingo. Yeah. What's yeah. what's good for me is good for everybody, right? There's exactly. no separate. There's no yeah, separate. Like, you know, my, my therapist did a game changer once, but this one sentence, even when you heal, the people around you heal too. And uh, yes. I'm not sure exactly if, if that's a direct translation to what we were just talking about, but it kind of, I see a yeah. parallel there. Because music is a medicine. It is medicine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one way or the other, we are uh, experiencing some form of healing. And uh, yes. it's it's the kind of thing which, you know, it's the kind of medicine that goes around and is consumed mm-hmm. by both the mentor and the person who's being mentored by the mentor. And it's a dynamic which kind of reverses pretty quickly too. Yes. Um, some of my students have gone on to be collaborators and even almost yeah. teachers in a lot of ways. Um, oh, yeah. okay. I love that. Right? Yeah, yeah oh. me too. And, and honestly, and I'm not saying this to sound cool, but that is kind of my ultimate aim to, to kind of mm-hmm. uh, build, you know, part of my process of building like-minded community is just uh now let me fra- rephrase that you know my ideal goal with a client or a student would be uh to for them to be part of that like-minded community i'm trying to build really yeah um, yeah and there i go hijacking the conversation again no, no it's, <laughs> uh, it's so good it's, it gives so much it's give, it's, it's uh, really wonderful I appreciate that. Um, how, how how are you pr- proceeding uh, with this side to your uh, artistic career as well? Do you plan to release more courses? Is this something you you look upon as an integral part of your journey now, or was it a one-off? You know, I've made another sort of mini course um, mm-hmm. on a different... So my original course was all about um, how to get your best sound out of the cello, out of your instrument. And That's the awesome. second one... And what I realized is that once you get a great sound, um, what holds p- people back is this idea of vibrato. And I don't know how how that translates into other, some instruments, obviously, like piano. It's not a thing. But for cello, it's such a big part of our sound that I thought, mm-hmm. okay, I need to address this. And so um, it's a little bit smaller in scope, but I really try to give people the, the foundations for healthy vibrato that can express more than um, maybe they could before. So it's expanding in, in that way. But I think um, personally, I am looking at other things right now that are um, more into improvisation, more into um, collaborations. And I think it's all part of the ecosystem. So I might, you know, kind of come back and do another course on that, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm still sort of exploring for myself and trying to figure out how I can share that with, with more people as I, as I learn. So. Beautiful. um, Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I love how you kind of, do look upon it as very much as, as part of your artistic journey, as opposed to a teaching hat you put on at the end of the day. Mm, yeah. You know, I happen to have spent a lot of time in an era where teachers were referred to as failed musicians. I don't know about you, if you've... Oh, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? And uh, I, I've uh, and I never agreed with it, uh, especially no. since my earliest mentors were two of the most badass musicians I've had. So uh, I love how um, those uh, lines are being blurred too. Yeah. Can I just add one thing to that? I think. Please. You can add more as, as much as you want. (laughs) 
I'm, I'm just guilty about stealing all the time. No, I love it. There's again, weren't we talking about how time is not really uh, linear? It's uh, oh, <laughs> I'm I'm happy to take it. Um, the what what I was thinking of the direct parallel to this is sort of. Um, something that a yoga teacher actually said one a, a couple of weeks ago to me. And, and he said that he lives by sort of three rules. Try something new, be amazed, tell everyone. Mm. And I think there's something about the tell everyone part that we think of as teaching, but it's actually just sharing. It's sharing our passion, sharing what we gets us excited it's you know and if it's not that i would maybe argue that you know we need to find what we're passionate about and then tell everyone about that instead of maybe telling everyone about something that we're not necessarily that's separate from from our real passions bingo that yeah you nailed it yeah <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's time that teachers started looking upon themselves as just really passionate people, excited to share the insight yes. music has given them, and figure out a you know a, a decent way to just go about it. Really, that's what teaching is at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. It's strange how uh, teachers have uh, come to kind of embody like some equivalent of a jewelry over the years throughout the history. Mm -hmm. well, one of our most esteemed guests on the podcast has been a gentleman by the name of Kenny Werner. I don't know if you've known mm -hmm. uh, heard of him. Yeah. Um, he wrote this book, Effortless Mastery, which was a game changer in the world of pedagogy. Yes. Right. Uh, and he, he talks about, you know, when was playing music a crime? Why is there a jury out at the university? Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, it's, and that's, that's actually so much, I mean, and we, yes. so, we, we normalize it. And I was like, hell yeah. I mean, that is so true. Why yeah. is the word jury mm. used for a panel of teachers in universities yeah. or conservatories? Ridiculous. So much to unpack there. Oh, wow. This has been an absolute pleasure and absolute mm -hmm. putting out there. Um, yes. Um, but before uh, we let you go, though, there is this uh, one uh, question I ask some of my guests, not all of them, but uh, the ones I know um, have something meaningful to respond with, which is uh, the first word we use in, in this podcast. Um, tapasya is a reference to an old act of burning fear away in the sacred fire. Mm -hmm. If you were in, a, in front of a s sacred fire today, what would you want to burn away? Mm. Oof. I think for me right now, the limitation that I'm um, currently working on is um, being seen, being visible. And so I would like to burn the invisibility cloak that I sometimes put on myself. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. And I'm really not saying this, uh, uh, but it's, yeah, that could actually be in my words as well. That is, yeah, top of the list. I managed the, whole, the entire podcast without cussing and, you know, and uh, <laughs> swore to us. <laughs> that is so typically me. But yeah, that, that's the only way I could have nailed the emotion. Yes. Yeah, I, well, I definitely hear you. Um, thank you so much for waking up at 8 a.m. in the morning to do this. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so stoked to have had you on. I'm so stoked we finally made this happen. Yeah. Um, you are uh, an inspiring and radiant musician, and um, I really hope more audiences are get privy to what you're doing. More, right. like, um, more audiences are aware of what you're out, um, doing uh, out there. Uh, needless to say, for my audiences, all links will be included uh, on the episode notes as well. And, and uh, thank you for doing this. Oh, it's really, truly my pleasure. And I'm just so grateful that 
we've connected and we made it happen. And just thank you. Thank you for being not only open and, and honest and vulnerable, but just for being so um, warm and generous with your uh, sharing and your questions. And, and it's just really, really a wonderful, it's a, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Right back at you. You made it really easy. <laughs> you know, I've had guests where it's, uh, where I really have to kind of put my cerebral intellectual hat on to kind of keep the flow going. In this case, and um, I've also had the pleasure of having guests where uh, we lose track of time, speaking of time, uh, we were almost at 90 minutes and I did not feel it pass by. Thank you for making it so effortless. Likewise. Likewise. On that note, gratitude from the bottom of my heart for listening to the very end. Please consider taking a minute to subscribe to our show so you know when the next episode is out. This is a labor of love, one I hope snowballs into one that's sustainable in its attempt to support independent thought and authentic relating. And having you as a regular member of our audience is what makes that a realistic prospect. Much love and talk soon. Just another voice out in.